From the Cervera Newsroom in sunny Miami, welcome to the Miami Real Estate Podcast, your home for expert insight on all things Miami real estate. I'm your host, Omar DeWint. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to the show. I'm Omar DeWint, Head of Communications for Cervera Real Estate. Today, we're putting the EB-5 Investor Visa Program under the scope. We want to educate foreign buyers and the real estate professionals servicing them how it works and how to apply. Currently, several projects in the South Florida marketplace offer EB-5, among those a Cervera exclusive, the Ocean Conrad Resort Residences in Fort Lauderdale Beach. Joining us in the studio today to walk us through the ins and outs of EB-5 is Julian Montero. Julian is a partner with Salt Ewing, Arnstein & Lear. He's also the vice chair of the business and finance department and the global immigration and foreign investment practice group. Julian, thanks for coming in. Omar, it's my pleasure. Thank you much for the opportunity. It's our pleasure. So let's get right to it, Julian. Uh, let's, if you could for us, uh, explain to our listeners what exactly is an EB-5 investor visa and why was it established? Absolutely. So EB-5 is a program that was created in 1990, largely to uh, foster and enhance the investment opportunities of foreigners in the U.S. Uh, with the notion that the foreign investor should then create jobs in the U.S. associated with their investment. The enticement for the foreign investor is the permanent residence that they obtained through the EB-5 process. So essentially, think about uh, raising capital from foreign investors and using that capital to create jobs in the U.S. Excellent. And so how exactly does that work? Sure. So the process really uh, involves uh, the uh, establishment of a project in the U.S., a commercial enterprise okay. that is going to qualify uh, for EB-5, meaning that investors that select that project will then be able to obtain their permanent residence. Uh, looking at this in a global perspective, uh, these programs are generally called Citizenship by Investment Programs, CBIs, okay. and many countries offer these programs. Canada, for example, the United Kingdom, Australia, many European countries offer these types of investment opportunities, and the U.S. version of this investment opportunity is EB-5. Okay, excellent. And so what, what, uh, what advantage or advantages does an EB-5 carry compared to some other visas that exist? Sure, absolutely. So as, as we know, there's an alphabet soup of visas, right? <laughs> um, the EB-5 fits into the category of visas that uh, leads to permanent residence. Okay. So the major distinction is a visa that would give a non-immigrant benefit, meaning the person, their family members, can come to the U.S., uh, uh, either study or work, and remain in the U.S. for a certain period of time. The distinction of EB-5 is that it is a process through which the family group will obtain lawful permanent residence, commonly called green card status in okay. the U.S., and then ultimately, once they are a resident for five years, be able to apply for U.S. citizenship. So to be clear then, the when you say the family group, the visa applies not just to the individual investor, but their wife or uh, kids and so on and so forth? That's correct. And that's an important uh, item to really highlight is that the uh, immigration benefit, which is permanent residence, is extended to the investor, investor's spouse, and children under 21 years of age. So we're finding that many family groups that have children perhaps of middle school or high school age, and uh, they perhaps have an interest mm -hmm. that these children come to the U.S. to study in universities and ultimately find some employment opportunities, this is a very common profile of the EB-5 investor that we're seeing today. Interesting. So tell me a little bit about the qualification requirements for, for EB-5. Sure. So there are two primary uh, qualification requirements for EB-5. Uh, the first, Omar, is the project. Mm -hmm. The project must be very particularly structured so that it complies with very specific requirements uh, that are uh, stipulated by the U.S. Immigration Authority, which is called USCIS, mm -hmm. so that investors that have selected that project will obtain this immigration benefit. I think the easiest way to understand this is that clearly not every single investment opportunity 
offers the green card. Right. right. So the project itself must be very specifically structured. That's one aspect. The second aspect is the investor's individual qualifications. Okay. And the primary focus there, Omar, is the source of funds. Okay. So the U.S. government uh, uh, rightfully wants to understand how the investor made their money and where the investment that is being invested into the project uh, comes from. Okay. Uh, just to uh, confirm, the investment amount for EB-5 right now is $500,000 mm -hmm. for most projects because most projects are situated in what is called a targeted employment area, or TEA. What does that mean exactly? Right. So what this means is that the project is situated near, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's flexibility here, sure. uh, an area that has been determined to have a higher amount of unemployment okay. than the national average. It's fairly technical, but the big picture notion is that the U.S. government, through its policies, wants to enhance development in certain areas where there has been some historic unemployment. Okay. Now, because it's flexible, you will find that uh, uh, prime areas of Manhattan mm -hmm. qualify for this, right? Prime areas of, of Florida. You mentioned a particular project that's on the beach, right? right? Um, so uh, th there is flexibility with respect to how a project qualifies for a TEA. Uh, but in essence, Omar, I would tell you 95% or perhaps even a greater percentage of projects do qualify and so the investment amount is five hundred thousand dollars, as opposed to one million dollars. Okay. So, and then in terms of risks, because when you talk about investment, you usually have to factor risk into the equation. Uh, are there any risks associated with the EB five investor visa? Absolutely. Um, the in fact, risk is an essential element of the the legal requirement. The investment must be at risk. Mm. This means that there are no uh, government guaranteed investment opportunities your money is not guaranteed. Um, it has to be invested into a commercial enterprise that is going to use those funds and mm -hmm. deploy them in the uh, creation, operation, uh, or refurbishment of that particular project. And that implies risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, investors need to mitigate the risk okay. by, number one, uh, undertaking proper due diligence of these projects and really understanding uh, what the project uh, entails, mm -hmm. who is the developer behind the project, where is the project in its completion timeline, uh, is it a project that has begun or uh, already completed, what are the other safeguards that that project may offer so that the investor can properly determine the risk and, and measure whether that is an acceptable level of risk. That's one. Two is obviously working with a team of professionals that have the uh, necessary experience to guide the investor through this process and ultimately uh, represent that investor uh, so that they will receive this benefit. In speaking of risk, one of the clear uh, uh, benchmarks of understanding risk for a particular project is whether that project has received what is called exemplar approval. Okay. And I know at the top of the show, we mentioned the Ocean uh, Resort Residences in Fort Lauderdale Beach. I believe they have exemplar approval status, correct? That's exactly right, Omar. So exemplar approval means that a project has already presented its documents, and we typically call them the offering documents or the project documents, to the U.S. Immigration Service for review. That oftentimes may take nine months or more, perhaps a year, uh, and so the developer in this instance has made a concerted effort and uh, an investment mm -hmm. in making sure that they are putting forth a project with the least possible risk by having the documents reviewed by the U.S. government, USCIS, the same agency that will review the investor's petition. Mm -hmm. And once USCIS reviews and approves uh, those uh, documents, it then will approve and issue what is called an exemplar approval, meaning the project qualifies for EB-5. The consequence of that is significant because any investor that selects a project that is exemplar approved will be approved so long as the investor themselves 
works with a lawyer that knows what they need to do to get the investor approved with respect to their source of funds. So mm. it really reduces the risk. If you want to think of it, if there's two aspects of risk, project risk and investor risk, right. by selecting an exemplar approved project. You're cutting out half of the, the risk. That's exactly right. Right. And a major component of risk. Excellent. So in terms of I know EB-5 is extremely popular, right? But it, it does, it's not without its, its critics. What do those opposed to EB-5, uh, what are their main arguments uh, against it? Sure. So what, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the primary arguments is the investment amount, okay. right? So as I mentioned, EB-5 has been around since 1990. Mm -hmm. The investment amount uh, when the law was promulgated in 1990 was $500,000 and a million. And in... 2018, it remains $500,000 in a million. So, and we all know the time value of money is not the same, sure. right? So $500,000 in 90 is much more than $500,000 today. So this is actually a bargain. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the other uh, programs mm -hmm. offered around the world that, that uh, provide a similar benefit, you will find that EB-5 and the U.S. program is among the least expensive of these programs. So wow. there's been an effort, actually, Omar, in Congress over the last two years to uh, try to modify this particular aspect of the law and increase the investment amount. To what amount? Uh, well, there's been different figures, 925,000, 1.2 million, and some of the others, and, and some other figures. Um, but in, an increase from 500 to 925,000 is obviously significant. Sure. There is a, a great window of opportunity right now to uh, analyze EB-5 if this is the right program uh, to, to proceed while this law remains at 500,000 because most people in the industry expect some increase within the near future or certainly the midterm. Interesting. Right. Um, so the time is now. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So excellent. And then let's so let's dive a little bit further because this this sounds very uh, appealing to me. Let's dive a little bit further. Walk me through the investment process for EB five. Absolutely. So we we know that it involves the selection of a project, mm -hmm. right? And as lawyers, uh, we don't give investment advice. We help the client once they have determined the project they're looking at. We will help them review uh, the characteristics of that project so that they really understand what they're getting involved with. But we're assuming they've already selected the project. Uh, and now what we do is we, we uh, will review the project documents with our clients. These project documents are fairly sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, uh, it, it's a securities offering, right? Because these investors are investing into a US-based uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these offering documents have to comply with very specific requirements from uh, an agency of the U.S. government that regulates uh, these investment activities, and that's the Securities and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. right? So the investor will receive, let's say, an inch or an inch and a half of, of legal documents associated with this <laughs> offering. And our first job is reviewing the offering documents with our clients, making sure they understand the nature of their investment and the risks associated with the investment. Once we uh, navigate that, we then focus on the investor mm -hmm. and uh, a very in-depth analysis of the source of funds of the investor. That's what this term is called in EB-5. Mm -hmm. We have to present to USCIS in this application a detailed explanation of where the investor made their money, how they made their money, and where they have maintained their money uh, through the course of, of their earnings until they invest the funds. The policy behind this, obviously, is that the U.S. government wants to make sure that people that are obtaining lawful permanent residence through this program are using funds that have been earned in standard ways that a, a person would legitimately make their money. Mm -hmm. uh, once we review the project, we have the project documents, we've reviewed the investor's source of funds, and we have their documents, we then prepare all of this together in an application, which is called Form I-526. Okay. So this is the petition that is submitted to the Immigration Authority, USCIS. Okay, and then in terms of the overall timeline, the approximate timeline, what, what does that look like for an investor? Sure. So right now, um, the bell curve 
of, of the, the average processing time of petitions, I would say is somewhere right around 16 months. Some a little bit shorter in, ter- in time. Some can, can go on for perhaps 18 months to two years, depending on the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that's, I would say, the average. So USCIS will review this application and then make a filing uh, a determination and approve, or if they have questions, communicate with the lawyer and ask specific questions associated with that petition so that the lawyer can have an opportunity to uh, respond and perfect the, the application. Once USCIS approves a petition, then one of two things can happen. If the investor is in the U.S. on some other type of visa, mm-hmm. and most commonly that would be a student visa, okay. uh, they can then proceed with what is called adjustment of status, meaning they will get their green card, permanent residence, directly through USCIS in the U.S. That's not that common in EB-5 as most of these investors are overseas uh, right. managing their affairs and getting ready to come to the U.S. with their family. So the most common process after USCIS has approved the I-526 petition is called consular processing. Okay. And what that means is that the investor, the family group, again, the investor, the spouse, and the children under 21 will have an interview at the U.S. Embassy or consular post that was designated in their application. And that's typically the consular post that is most convenient to uh, the city that they live in. Uh, They will have that interview, and at that interview, uh, they will receive uh, essentially the the equivalence of permanent residence so that they're able to travel to the U.S. with this visa stamp, the EB-5 visa stamp, Mm -hmm. and enter as permanent residence of the U.S. Now, that initial permanent residence has a condition. Okay. So it's called conditional lawful permanent residence. And the it's contingent on what? Correct. So so it this creates quite a bit of confusion. Some people call it a temporary green card. It's not a temporary green card. It's not temporary residence. It's actually permanent residence mm-hmm. subject to a condition. The condition uh, lasts for 24 months okay. after they enter. So again, let's go big picture. I'm selecting a project now. Mm-hmm. I have, I'm working with a team diligently. I'm filing my application. USCIS is going to take, let's say, 18 months to approve it. Sure. I'm then going to have my interview at uh, the consular post in Sao Paulo or Bogota or Buenos Aires or mm-hmm. wherever that may be, Istanbul. And um, I will obtain my uh, visa stamp and be able to come to the U.S. as a conditional lawful permanent resident about two years from the moment I made my application. Okay. That conditional lawful permanent resident status will have a 24-month condition from that period of time. Mm -hmm. So looking forward two years, another two years. And your question was, it's contingent on what? Well, it's contingent on the project being able to provide very specific financial records that confirm that the funds were used by the project in the manner they were intended to be used, meaning the person didn't go out and buy a yacht. Mm -hmm. They actually used the funds in the creation (laughs) of the project. So if you think about it, this is a really, really good protective mechanism for these investors, right? right? Um, So you'll find all the top tier projects have no no problem with this. There's been very few other than there have been cases of of fraud, right? But the, the vast majority of projects are, are undertaken by uh, s- developers that have experience in doing that particular type of project. They're using the funds in, in the manner that they were intended to be used. Most of these projects also rely on third-party financial uh, institutions that, that monitor uh, the, the use of these funds. So it's, it's a very, very technical and, and regulated process. Uh, so to but re- the moral of the story is that the, the boating industry has not seen a spike in, <laughs> in sales as a result of EB-5. I, right? I would hope not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so then, then the, the investor will, will uh, file this application to remove the condition. And at that point, one of the important things about EB-5 is there is an expectation that the investor will recoup their $500,000 investment, right? So again, if we understand that EB-5 is another of these worldwide programs, Mm -hmm. right, where you have families, uh, families that have certain wealth Mm -hmm. uh, that are interested in leaving their country for whatever reason has motivated them. It's a very personal uh, uh, decision. 
they're looking at other opportunities. They want to open up new horizons. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they have selected the U.S., mm-hmm. and, and I'm very happy that they've selected the U.S. I'm, I'm an immigrant, and, and, and my family went through that process. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've selected the U.S., and they've determined that EB-5 is suitable for them. Uh, so so that, that's really a wonderful part of, of this narrative. And so in terms of the timing, you've done a great job in painting the, the big picture. Is there anything left in that process after the conditional uh, approval? No, that, that, uh, they, they can uh, become a, a citizen five years uh, after obtaining that, that first conditional residence. Right? right. So they don't even have to wait for the, the removal of that condition, which is an important distinction. And um, again, most of these projects will return the $500,000 investment uh, to the investor uh, in about five years uh, from the moment that the investor has made that investment. And so my understanding is, aside from the $500,000 investment, the only thing that would not be uh, a returned would be obviously the fees, attorney's fees, and any other fees? That's correct. So obviously they, they, they need to select qualified attorneys. Uh, most of these projects have an administrative fee that they mm-hmm. charge. That's an expense. However, uh, virtually all projects provide, uh, think of it as a coupon, an mm-hmm. annual interest return to these investors. It's nominal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the industry really hovers at uh, uh, you know, 0.5% annual return per year. That seems to be the standard, although it, 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 it has lately been increased by, by some projects. But, but that's sort of the benchmark uh, annual return that the investor can expect. Speaking of uh, excellent attorneys, we're talking to Julian Montero here. He is a partner with Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lear, also the vice chair of the business and finance department and the global immigration and foreign investment practice group. Julian, this has been a lot of fun. You've uh, broken down. I think you've made it very clear for me, definitely. I hope for those out there, how EB-5 works. Uh, before we go, is there anything that we're missing? Any uh, final thoughts on, on EB-5 or how it works? Well, I think it's important to note that uh, Congress has been uh, attempting to uh, reform EB-5, mm-hmm. and, and I mentioned uh, potential increase. Um, it is likely to happen. We don't know when. Uh, it was expected perhaps end of September this year. I personally don't believe that will be the case, uh, but it is in the works, mm-hmm. and, and there is a reason behind an increase. So if people are interested in EB-5 and perhaps have been reviewing this option for a while, um, the sooner you make that decision that this is right for you and your family, uh, the greater the chance you'll be able to lock into that $500,000 investment amount. Excellent. So we're going to leave it there. For those of you that are interested, if you yourself are interested in, in uh, taking advantage of EB-5 or you're working with an investor who would be interested, we're going to include uh, Julian's information in the show notes. We'll also have a link to uh, a brochure and some other collateral on EB-5 that really breaks down the process in a, in a granular uh, manner. But uh, Julian, thanks again for coming in. And thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been fun. Thank you, Omar. How was that, right? Pretty painless? Yeah, great. <laughs> Absolutely. Great, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we certainly enjoyed making it. We hope you will come back. We've got some more great content dedicated to informing, intriguing, and inspiring Miami real estate professionals. Where can you find us? We're on the podcast store, wherever podcasts are available. That's iTunes, of course. We're also on Podbean, Spotify, Audible, TuneIn, Stitcher, and Google Play. You can even ask Alexa about us. Go ahead and visit Cervera.com slash blog. That's where our newsroom is located. We've got some more great content there as well, market reports, and more. You can sign up for our newsletter there. Connect with us on social at Cervera RE or send us an email, Miami Real Estate Podcast at Cervera.com. We would love to hear from you. So, from all of us here in Miami, where the future is always bright, until next time. Thank you.